Now, uh, I want to start off, and I know that some people aren't big fans of this place, but you got to be honest. Walmart, it's a pretty cool place. Where else can you go to get a geranium, to get a frozen pizza, a set of new tires for your monster stomper, fish hooks, diapers, and a bag of apples? Right? It's all right there. When we came back from the mission field, we couldn't actually, we would walk into Walmart and have to leave. It was just too much, the cereal aisle especially. There's like 50 choices in there. In Russia, there was one or none. So if there was one, it was simple. You just grab that bag of cornflakes and you get out of there and be thankful you had it. But it was, it was rough. But I, I do like Walmart for that. You can get anything there. One-stop shopping, right? The city of Pergamos is a lot like that. And I think you're going to recognize Pergamos because if Pergamos had a parallel in our world, it would have to be America. Everything you can want, ask, it was in this city. As we're looking at this city, I want us to be looking for three things. I want you to walk away encouraged that you can be faithful in in an evil world. It is possible to follow the Lord and do what he says. I also want you to walk away knowing in your heart that it's very important. Doctrinal purity matters a great deal. And then third, I want you to walk away knowing that God is everything you need. So let's go ahead and read the passage. We're going to do our thing. Let's go ahead and stand if you can. I'm going to read the black. You're going to read the red corally. So here we go. And to the angel of the church of Pergamos, write. These things says the king who has the two-edged sword. I know your works. And where you dwell. Where Satan's throne is. And you hold fast to my name. And did not deny my faith. Even in the days in which Antipas was slain by the martyr. Who was killed among you where Satan dwells. But I have a few things against you. Hmm. I don't like those words. Because you have there who, those who hold, the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed to idols. And to sexual immorality. Thus you also have those who hold the doctrine of the which thing I hate, yes. or else I will come to you quickly with the sword of my mouth. Let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. I will give some of the hidden manna to eat, and on the stone a new name written, except him who receives it. Amen. Amen. Go, go ahead and have a seat. So on to Pergamos. We've been through Ephesus. We've been through Smyrna, two different churches in two different towns, but nearby. As you can see, Pergamum's way up there, and there's a confluence of three seas that they kind of benefit from. The word Pergamos means height or elevation. They are elevated. It's a city that's set prominently on a hill in Asia Minor. Present day today, it's Izmir, Turkey a predominantly Muslim nation. It was at one point the capital of the Roman province of Asia. It had something, as I said, for everyone. Commerce, politics, spirituality, entertainment, intellectual pursuit. This town had everything that you could want. It was close to the coast, so you could buy products from all around the world. There was nothing that you couldn't get your hands on. It was famous also for its many temples. There was a temple celebrating just about every Greek god in that time. And if you add them all up, you pretty much have an answer for most of the things in life. For instance, do you need strength? 
You need power? You crave power, perhaps? Well, you could go to the Temple of Zeus. Um, that's not my gig, Pastor. I want to indulge my flesh. My flesh. I just want to sow my oats. I want to drink until the cows come home. Well, then you would go to the Temple of Dionysus. Drunkenness and orgies, plentiful there. So you could find what you needed there. Or maybe you needed some wisdom. Well, you could go to the Temple of Athena, the goddess of wisdom. Don't you believe it? God is the God of wisdom. But they would go there seeking wisdom from Athena. But then you're like, no, no, no. What I actually need, I need, I need some healing. You could go to the temple of Asclepius. You could come in, and they would give you a potion, and they would put you in a room and lay you on a floor, and then in came all these snakes. And the snakes would slither around you and wrap around you, and that was all part of your healing. You'd be healed. If you go back to slide six, you see that symbol? A lot of people think that came from Moses. No, it came from Asclepius and the, the healing. They would literally bring these snakes in. That creeps me out. Parchment was first used in the town of Pergamos. They had one of the finest libraries. That's the remains of it, some of it. 200,000 books, they say, that they had there. They had an amphitheater there that seats 10,000 people. Look at how steep that is. It's one of the steepest in the world. 10,000 people could entertain themselves, be entertained. Do you see what I'm saying? It's kind of like America, isn't it? It's got everything. It's got a little bit of everything for it. And so Jesus writes a letter to this church, a place where you had material wealth, you had spiritual avenues, and even if you were into the darker things, there was plenty of demonic activity here. You could get into that if you wanted to. They had it all. Intellectual pursuits. Let's talk about the latest things. Let's have many, many, many colleges, and we'll just puff ourselves up with knowledge. You could do that there. And the interesting thing was, whatever you did, it was okay. Judge not, lest ye be judged. You could just do whatever you wanted there. And nobody's going to, oh, is that your thing? I, I feel like doing that. I feel like doing this. Brother, that's awesome. And in the midst of it, if you go back to I put a little tiny picture of a church. You see the little church there? We talked about pressure last week. The, the church of Smyrna was being squeezed. You remember that, that word, philipsis, where they would crush you with stones and keep adding stones on until you confessed or repented or whatever they wanted you to say. There's stone after stone. There's all this pressure. This place has a lot of pressure. But it's the pressure to compromise. To say, I'll just add a little of this. There's a story in, uh, that's gone around quite a few times. But my grandmother, she used to make the most wonderful oatmeal cookies. Mm, I know it's right before lunch. I'm sorry. So grandma, Grandma Basut, she would make these cookies the finest oats she could find. The finest brown sugar she could find the finest of everything. But there was one ingredient that she didn't tell everybody was in there. Dog dew. <laughs> There's just a little bit in there. Just, just a little bit. The question is, of course, do you still want the cookies? I hope you would say no, right? You might have eaten them not knowing, right? <laughs> no, my grandma did not do that. But it illustrates the point, doesn't it? Because we say it's just a little compromise. Just a little bit. But when that little bit works through the whole batch of dough, that's a problem, isn't it? And it's a problem when we're trying to be like Christ in the midst of all these pressures to, to compromise. The young people today, my wife and I were talking about it this morning. In an instant, at 10 years old, you can be watching these vile, vile things that your buddy sent you because they thought it was funny. 
It's at your fingertips. It's not like you got to go at dark into a place. It's in your hands. So the choice is yours, isn't it? And, and we can't help what we see, but you can turn it off like the movie that my wife and I tried to watch the other day. So oh, it'll be fine. <laughs> what? What? <laughs> Honey, turn it off. <laughs> Quick. We live in a wicked world. That is not going to change. And in fact, the way I read my Bible, it's just going to get worse. But we can live like Christ. And not only can we, we should. We must. And if we do, guess who's going to see? Because when it's really dark and you put a little light in there, that little light is going to illuminate the whole room. Jesus wants us to be a light, and we can't compromise. So he says to this church, he says, to the angel of the church of Pergamos, write. And notice the first thing that he tells them. He tells them, this is the character trait of me that I want them to know, to remember. And notice what he says. These things, says he who has the sharp two-edged sword. The sharp two-edged sword. A two-edged sword that reminds me of the description of the Son of Man in Revelation 1.16. Here's what it says. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shines in its, in its strength. I notice that it's sharp, right? This is a sharp instrument. And if it's two-edged, it means it cuts both ways. And in fact, it will cut that way too. But you ever notice when you're using knives, we used to have a guy that would come around the neighborhood with his little cart, and he would sharpen knives. I was like, that's kind of nice, you know? Because when you use knives, they need to be sharpened every once in a while, don't they? Because they get dull. But I noticed that this is sharp. And it's two-edged. It's almost redundant, isn't it? A two-edged sword is going to be sharp, and then Jesus says it's sharp, just letting us know that the Word of God is sharp. And that, of course, reminds us, brings us to Hebrews 4.12, doesn't it? Here's what Hebrews 4.12 says. For the Word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit. And of joints and marrow, it is a discerner of the thoughts. That, well, that's why people don't like it. You read the word of God and you get convicted. But don't you know that's good? Don't you know in the hands, a sword can be a, a weapon of unbelievable destruction. But in the hands of Jesus Christ, that sword is the, like a surgeon's knife, isn't it? It's a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. See why we need it. When we get to thinking about doctrine, doctrine has this ability like grandma's cookies to look, you know, a false doctrine. Oh, it looks pretty nice on the outside. But inside there's a, just a little bit of poison, right? And what is that poison? That poison, you'll find, it looks like it's honoring God, but it's really about me. False doctrine always winds up that way. It's about me. I want to do such and so, so I am going to create a false doctrine that allows me, you're really, it's idolatry, isn't it? I'm creating a God that allows me to sin in the way in which I want to sin. That's why false doctrines are so destructive. The sword, it's a, symbol of power, isn't it? A conquering general would be given the privilege of taking his troops and all the people through the throngs of people that they helped save their lives, and he would go down holding a sword in this parade, this victor's parade. That's why Paul said, right? Paul said that we are led in triumphal procession, and the person leading it the one holding the sword, the one that had done the battle and who was the victor, carried the sword and led everybody in triumphal procession. 
Do we need the sword? What is the sword? Well, clearly, it's the Word of God. It is the Word of God. That's why it's so important that we study the Word of God. Do we not see an increase of false teachers, false doctrines? The Internet's wonderful, isn't it? I can find all sorts of podcasts and, this cat and videos on YouTube, and I can watch all sorts of things. But you know, some of it's not right, right? We've got to be aware. We have to understand that there are liars out there who will feed your flesh so that you feed their bank account. We need to be careful. Psalm 119 says this, How can a young person keep or stay on the path of purity? By living according to your word. Not just hearing it. Not just obeying your parents and going to church and, and hearing the teacher sound like Charlie Brown's teacher, right? Wah, 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 wah. I don't know what that guy said. It was probably about Jesus, so that's what I'll say at the end of it. How was the sermon? It was, yeah, it was good. What was it about? Yeah, it was about Jesus. <laughs> ding, 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 ding. You're, you're right. Wow, you were really paying attention today. <laughs> but sharp instruments dull with use, don't they? Iron sharpens iron. We need the word of God. And verse 13, it says, I know your works, and I know where you dwell. Those two thoughts to me, they belong together. I know your works, and I know where you're doing those works. I know where you have to live. Jesus, first of all, he knows, doesn't he? He knows. He knows what we're going through individually and corporately. He knows. He knows your works. These, this, that's a compliment. He says, I know your works, and I know how hard it is to live where you live. How does he know? Because he lived here. He dwelt among us, yet he was without sin. He is the one with a sword leading us in triumphal procession. We don't have to sin, you see. We don't have to. We can live for Christ in the midst of a perverted and crooked generation. We can do it. He says, I know your works. I know where you dwell. And notice he says, where Satan's throne is. Most logical conclusion there, if it's a person, it's probably Zeus. Or it could be one of the emperors, Nero, Domitian, Trajan, one of these guys, because they were all pretty bad. Or how about we just simplify things? We live in a world that is Satan's throne. He likes it here. He loves what he does. He wants to get us ineffective. He wants us to just go ahead and indulge that sin nature so that you feel guilt, so that you won't serve. And he says, you live where Satan's throne is. But notice, he compliments them. Despite that, despite that, you hold fast you hold fast to my name. And you did not deny, and this is very important, I, I've never noticed this before, he says, my faith. Jesus is talking and he says, it's my faith. You survive because Jesus gave you faith. Even that was a gift of God. That's pretty cool. There's so much to unpack here. He knows how difficult it is. He knows, like, like if you were to live in California, he knows what those churches are going through. He knows what Jack Hibbs' church is going through. He knows the, the church that's been fined millions of dollars at this point because they keep opening and they won't obey the order to stay closed. That's them listening to the Lord. That's awesome. But maybe you're on a more personal thing. Pastor, I see that there's things going on in the church, but right now, right now, the thing that I'm dealing with, I feel like Satan is in my house, and he's set up his throne in my life, and I don't, I don't know what to do. I feel like my life is like Las Vegas, 
because I started over here and I let a little compromise come in and now it's just flooded the gates. But these guys, they got it done despite the pressure of getting sucked into a world where I could be a Christian and then indulge all my wanton pleasures. Where Satan's throne is here. It's temporary, though. You know he's on a leash. And his lease for this world, it, it's come and due. And he's going to get his. So if God is ramping up his efforts, you better believe that Satan is going to ramp up his. But he, again, he loves it here. This is his stomping grounds, right? He loves to stomp on people. And he dwells here. He's dwelling here. But remember that word dwell? It, it means for a time. There's going to be a time where, where Jesus is going to come back and destroy him. There's a lot of stuff that happens in there. But the ultimate thing is Satan is going to be put down for all the rest of eternity. He knows his time is short. Satan, the prince of evil spirits, he's the inveterate adversary of the God, of God, of Jesus Christ. Here's some of the things that he enjoys doing. This is how his mind works. He loves to incite apostasy from God and to sin. He loves to confuse men and women by his wiles. Just get them confused. Oh, I'm not sure. I'm confused. That's his forte. The worshipers of idols are said to be under his control. By his demons, he's able to take possession of men and inflict them with diseases. And he loves to get us to compromise. He's a master mimic. He loves to imitate. You know, some people get afraid of the number 666. <gasps> I love the way my pastor put it. He said, a six will never be a seven. It'll get pretty close. It'll imitate. But a six will never be a seven. Jesus' number is the number of completion, seven, or seven, seven, seven. And by God's assistance, he, Satan, is overcome. That's important. Don't walk out of here and go, man, that was a good, I'm pumped up. I'm going to take on Satan. Please no. Please no. He would whoop up on you in a hot second. Your protection is Jesus Christ and having the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit keeps us so secure against all these false doctrines if you'll listen to the voice of the Spirit and when it matches up with the Word. Because if there's a voice telling you to do something that goes against the Word, this is what you trust. But by God's assistance, the enemy will be overcome. On Christ's return from heaven, he will be bound with chains for a thousand years. And when the thousand years are finished, he will walk the earth in yet greater power, but shortly. And after that, he will be given over to eternal punishment. You can say hallelujah and amen. amen. Hallelujah. That's going to be a great day. And in the midst of all this, Jesus says, listen, I see how you hold fast. The word there is krateo, to not discard, to not let go of. You can't let go of these things. And they didn't. You didn't let go of my name. Why? You didn't let go of my name. That doesn't seem all that. Uh, yeah, look at the Ten Commandments. There's one in there about God's name, isn't there? His name is extremely important. And every time we see his name in different forms, it has to do with his character, doesn't it? So if you impugn his name, you're impugning his character. Satan did that, didn't he? Did God really say? Did he really say that? getting us to doubt God, but these guys clung on to his name. Philippians 2, 9 through 11, Therefore God has highly exalted him, Jesus Christ, and given him, Jesus Christ, the name which is above every other name, that at the name of Jesus, and I love this, 
every knee will bow. It didn't say all believers' knees will bow. It said every Satan's going to bow his knee. He's not going to want to, but he's going to have to. We choose to bow our knee, and that's the best way. Jesus, every knee should bow of those in heaven and those on earth and those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess. Some against their will, we choose to confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And so we clung to his name, we clung to his faith. Even in the days, he says, like my faithful martyr Antipas, it's not a salad. But we don't know much about him, and we're pretty sure, I say we, I don't know who we is, um, but we're, we're pretty sure that he uh, didn't invent a salad either. But there's not a lot known about him. But I thought I would go back to Smyrna, because there was a gentleman there, and his name is Polycarp. Polycarp was the bishop or overseer of Smyrna. They think the, the theologians, they think that Antipas was probably the bishop of Pergamos. But we're going back to the previous letter to discuss a guy named Polycarp. He was apprehended by the authorities for preaching about Jesus, and he was thrown into prison only to be held for a certain point at which they would kill him. That's what a prison was. So you knew when you're in prison, this is just the first step. The second step is they're either going to burn me at the stake or crucify me or kill me some way. And so Polycarp requested that he would be given one hour so that he could pray before they killed him. They obliged. They said, sure, you can go ahead and have an hour for prayer. It is written in Fox's Book of Martyrs that he prayed so fervently and so hard that the guards repented of their sin and gave their life to Jesus Christ at the power of this man's prayer. So they, attach, they go to attach him to the stake, and you know what he said? You don't need to do that. I'm not going anywhere. Imagine that. You don't need to bind me to the stake. You're going to light the fire, light the fire. I'm not going anywhere. The proconsul urged him, saying, Swear, I will release you. Just reproach Christ. Don't make me do this. Polycarp answered this. Eighty and six years I have served him, and he never wronged me once. How then shall I blaspheme my king who hath saved me? So they set about the fire. They lit it on fire. And the observers there said that it swirled around him but wouldn't go anywhere near him. And so they said, hey, you need to kill this guy. So pierce him in the side like they did with Jesus, right? So they stab him in the side, and the account says that he bled so profusely that it put the fire out. <laughs> Eventually, they finished the job. But what a witness! What a witness. At any point, he could have said, no, it's just a little compromise. I, I want to live. I want, I, I want to treat my life as precious. And he said, no, there's something way more precious. And that's my witness for Jesus Christ. And I will not compromise. Compromise, the word I was thinking about it in English, and I might be carrying this a little too far, but it's co, it's got that word together in it. And then Promise. And oftentimes, you know, like, we need to compromise when we're married, right? You guys, there's times where we need to compromise, okay? So I'm not saying all compromise is bad. But I'm talking about the compromise where Jesus is telling me one thing, and I want to indulge my flesh, so I say yes to, to Satan over here. And now I've promised two people who don't work on the same team, something's going to give, right? Something's got to give. I've made promises to both of these. In that sense, my mind, my heart is unequally yoked. And he says, I have these things against you because you have there those who hold the doctrine of Balaam. Doctrine, a way of teaching. They were being taught something. Balaam, it says here, taught Balak to put stumbling blocks before the children of Israel. 
So Balaam heard something, and he told Balak about it, and then Balak started teaching that. Where's Jesus in all of that? Where's the word of God in all of that? Do you see what's going on? Do you see where false doctrine comes from? Our brains, our head. And then I tell somebody, and then they believe what I say, and then they tell somebody else, but they never go back to the word of God to check it. False doctrine. Both of these things that Jesus points out are doctrinal in nature. And I'm thankful that he says that some of these guys hold, same word, they hold to these false doctrines. And people do that, don't they? They become this thing. I can't let go of this thing because I believed it and people saw that I believed it and I put my whole self into it and now I'm stuck because i got to keep holding on to it. I can't let go of the grip. You know, Satan knows doctrine, doesn't he? He, he knows this word and he loves to just mangle it, just twist it. He doesn't even have to mangle it, does he? Just, just a little twist. And he's got you. I thought of a relay race. Okay? And in a relay race, you're running, and then you have something in your hand, right? A baton? Okay? And then the person that's going to run next has to grab the baton, okay? And then they start running. And faith is like that, kind of, right? But imagine that instead of a baton, the person running before you has a lit stick of dynamite. That's false doctrine. The baton is the word of God. It's what's right. It's what's good. It's written down for us. But if I'm holding on to that stick of dynamite, Uh, well, I got a little bit of wick going on, so I just keep running. And maybe I'll just pass it on to the next guy. But if you pass that on to the next guy, eventually the wick is going to go down, and boom! It's going to destroy lives. Shipwreck faiths. So Balaam is his first example. Balaam, God gave Balaam prophetic gifting But all the time, his heart is all about that money. It's all about that coin, isn't it? All about them Benjamins. I'll do that. I'm going to make some money while I'm doing it. Balaam, prophet for hire, right? Jehovah compelled the people. And he said, you're going to bless them anyways. You're going to bless them anyways. But the Jewish people saw him, Balaam, as an abandoned deceiver. He had these prophetic giftings. He used them for his own gain. And oftentimes, he ended up speaking God's truth almost against his own will, right? And let's think about those things. Stumbling blocks. Eating things sacrificed to idols. You probably didn't do that this morning. And you probably didn't commit sexual immorality this morning either before you came in. But I have a question for you. Why is this so serious? Because all three of those things are attached to spirituality. The sexual immorality, it was part of my worship. I'm worshiping God here because I've mixed the world, and the purity of God's word together. And why do they do that? Because they want to commit sexual immorality. They want to do whatever they want to do, but they've mixed it all together. The idols, they were bought in the market. Is that bad? No, Paul discusses that. That's that's not that. Your conscience should be clean. Go ahead and eat that. But this, you are participating in and idolatry. All of these are dangerous false doctrines. And I'm kind of glad, though, because we don't have any false doctrines trying to creep into the church today. So that's nice. This was back then. Today, 
we're clean. There's, there's no charlatans out there trying to... And he mentions the Nicolaitans. Unlike Ephesus, remember, Jesus complimented them. Hey, you guys booted those guys on out of there. The Nicolaitans, the, the heavy shepherding people. But these guys didn't reject it. They allowed it. And it's interesting, right? So there's these two main things that Jesus points out, both flesh-feeding false doctrine, and they allowed it. Notice what it says. He says, repent. You might be in here and you're like, yeah, I kind of believe that thing, and now I've read the scriptures, and, and somebody showed me this and that, and then I went back to the scriptures, and I realized I've been buying in to a false doctrine. What do you do? Well, Jesus tells you right here, repent. It means to change your mind, to turn around, turn away from it. I talked to a dear sister in the Lord last night, just called out of the blue, and we were just talking about some of the things that she started listening to. And then she got a hold of some sound teaching, and then she realized, I've written this book, and some of the things that I used to believe were in that book. I need to get them out of there. I need to get any hint out of there. See, when you repent, things change. So, so if you've gotten mixed up with some false doctrine, okay, well, you keep talking about false doctrine. How do I know? Here's how you know. And I learned this from Pastor Jeff Johnson, Calvary Chapel, Downey, California. When we were over in Russia, he came over and taught us pastors for a little while. And he said, here's how you know if it's doctrinal, if it's to that level if it is a black and white type of thing, did Jesus teach it? Did Jesus teach it? Then you look in the book of Acts. Did the first church utilize it or practice it or put it into practice? And then the third thing, do the epistles discuss it? I'll just give you one example. Baptism, did Jesus teach it? Yes. Did the first church do it? Did the epistles discuss it or modify it or change it, help it? You know, because there were things. How about communion? Did Jesus tell us to do communion? Did the first church do it? How about the epistles? They had to correct Corinth, didn't they? Yeah. So that's a nice way to know those serious doctrinal things. But we just need to study the word. Repent, and he says, or else I will come to you quickly. Notice this. I will come to you quickly and will fight against them. That's interesting. I'm coming to you, and if you don't repent, I'm coming to you quickly, and I'm going to fight against them. I think he's talking to church leadership. You've fallen asleep at the wheel. You're allowing all these things. You're just, you know, you got these guys in here teaching the things of Balaam and the Nicolaitans, and you just allow it, Jesus is coming to you quickly. And then he says, I'll fight against them. You know what he's saying? Here's what I think he's saying. I'm going to have to come there and do your job for you if you don't take care of it. But it's simple. Just repent. Just repent. In verse 17, he who has an ear, let him hear. What the Spirit says to the churches, to him who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna to eat, and I will give him a white stone. Man. And on the stone, a new name written, which no one knows, except him who receives it. So if you tell people what your spiritual heavenly name is, you just lost it. But that's pretty cool. He says, to him who overcomes, what does that mean? It means that you can't overcome. Why would Jesus make promises to people who would never overcome? He's telling you, you can overcome. You can live in this sin-infested world and not sin. You can do it. You need the Word of God. You need to study the Word of God and protect yourself. And you need to be around brothers and sisters who will call you to the carpet if you need it. Hey, I see that going on in your life, and it's not good. I see you listening to that teacher. Don't listen to that teacher. They're taking you down a path. 
And they might not like you for it. Oh, well, well, she's my favorite. I just love her. What is she teaching you doctrinally? See, doctrine matters. The correct way of doing things. Doctrine matters. And the only way I'm getting at doctrine is by studying the word. We're talking about end times. Sunday school, right? This morning, Jonathan taught the three major views of the the tribulation rapture. Some believe before, they're correct, and some believe the mid. Well, I'm sorry, did I say that? But we taught about all three, right? Because you need to determine. You need to come to that understanding of this is a doctrine, and I'm going to hang my coat on it. This is hugely important. The Trinity, hugely important. The virgin birth, huge. The crucifixion, the literal resurrection of Jesus Christ. We, we have to, that, that is like foundational. What did Jesus say about doctrine? Well, if you've been doing the Blue Letter Bible study, we were going through Matthew, or I'm sorry, Mark chapter 7 this week. And so there's a conversation with Jesus and the Pharisees, and Jesus says, well, let's see what the Pharisees said. Hey, Jesus, and this is a paraphrase, hey, Jesus, why do your fel- followers not wash their hands before they eat? It's a decent question, right? That's kind of disgusting. Wash your hands. But Jesus says, because he is polite and doesn't want to step on any toes, he says, y'all are a bunch of hypocrites. <laughs> I love Jesus. He, I love he. He is not going to play with those religious people, is he? He's just going to, boom, because he wants them to stop being religious and be relational with them. You're all a bunch of hypocrites. Isaiah was dead on about y'all when he prophesied. You just give me lip service. Yes, I like, I love God. And then you live like hell. I love Jesus. I love Jesus, but he doesn't change your life. He doesn't change your behavior in any way whatsoever. He says, you guys are hypocrites. And the Pharisees are blown away. It's like, what? How, how, how's that? And so he quotes Isaiah 29 to him. And here's how. This is what you're doing. You're teaching as commandments the doctrines of men. A man came up with it. The quadernity, you ever heard of that? Some Catholics believe that Mary is a co-redemptrix with Jesus. No. No, she's not. She was a sinner who needed Jesus to die on the cross. She's a great lady, probably. I can't wait to give her a high five, because if I, you know, I don't want to make Joseph mad. He's probably still, you know, a little twisted around. And he says in verse 8, For you lay aside the commandment of God. You hold, same word, you hold the tradition of men. Why do we do this? Because it's a tradition. Because the church fathers said, this is what we do. Did Jesus? Last time I checked, this is Jesus' church. This is his faith. It's all about Jesus. He is the one to whom we have to do. You lay aside the commandment of God and you hold the tradition of man, the washing of pitchers and cuffs and many other such things you do. Later on, he'll call them whitewashed tombs, full of dead man's bones, but you look great on the outside. You're all dressed up and spanky for church. And you might even have a a plate on on the back of the chair because you donated to buy some chairs for the church. And Jesus is like, no, he's not. He's looking for men and women who have faith, that will overcome, that will not compromise. Phil Keggy wrote a song about people walking in two worlds. Stop it. I'm talking to myself. I'm talking to you. Stop trying to please the world. Live for Jesus Christ. What a great time it is for us to live for Jesus Christ. Because if we live for Christ, if we do what God's word, we're going to get noticed. We might even get in trouble. If I keep preaching the word, I might be preaching to you from jail, but 
We got Zoom. I love this. He says, I'm going to give you two things if you overcome. And we'll close here. He said, I'm going to give you hidden manna. This is not some esoteric knowledge that only you are going to have. Let's, let's put that over here. What was the manna? Exodus, right? Food that ran, rained down from heaven. Six days. And on the sixth day, they were to gather two portions. The whole lesson was about us trusting God. And he says, I'm going to give you hidden manna. Who's it hidden to? The people of the world. Because the people of the world, you're going to look ridiculous. Poor. Destitute. You've been forsaken. If God is so loving, why are you in jail for your faith? You're going to look ridiculous. But God promises that he is going to take care of you every step of the way. And imagine how great it's going to be in heaven. For great is your reward. Great is your reward in heaven. And then he says, a white stone. Most likely, that was an invitation. In that day, you didn't get a paper invitation. You got an invitation on stone, like Fred Flintstone. And it was just a little, little thing like this. And he says, I have a name for you. No one knows it. And maybe this week, he's going to share that name with you. It's a name because he knows you. It's a name of, you know, just tender mercies and love. And here's this name that only you and Jesus know. What is he saying? He's saying, listen, I've invited you. This is my world. It may look like Satan's. It may look like it's difficult. But at some point in the near future, I'm going to make everything right. And you're with me. And you can come in. I've invited you. You can be faithful. You sh you've got to be faithful. People are looking at you. Sometimes, kind of, what's going on with that person? Why did they just do that? You ever made somebody do that? When you did something right, but everybody else does it wrong? Like paying taxes, for instance? You can be faithful. We need to read the word, the word of God. He's, he's telling us so strongly in here, isn't he? Keep doing that. Keep doing that. And don't look anyplace else. Because everything that you need for life and godliness is in Christ Jesus. Everything. And then one day, we're going to turn our eyes upon Jesus. And we're going to look full on his wonderful. Imagine how beautiful he is. And then the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you love us and that you rough us up sometimes. <laughs> but I thank you for that too. I thank you that you know and you see all things and you tell us ahead of time you're a good father. And we love you so much. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.